Boy in the Back of the Class, Chapter 18, Stan, the Taxi Man. I'm not sure if Tintin ever woke up on the morning of an adventure feeling hungry and sick at the exact same time, but that's how I felt when I woke up the next day. It was so early that the birds had only just started to sing and the sun hadn't risen properly yet. As soon as the sky began to turn from dark blue to golden pink, I jumped out of bed and started to get ready. The hardest thing was trying to fit my school uniform over my best clothes. It made me look all puffy, like a blowfish, and the buttons on my school shirt like they might pop open at any moment. But luckily mum didn't notice anything because she was tired and still rubbing her eyes a lot when I left. I got to the bus stop 15 minutes early, just like we said we would, but there was no one there except an old lady and two grown-ups in suits. After a few minutes, Tom came running up the road. I could tell right away he hadn't slept much because his eyes looked red and his usually spiky hair was flat at the, in the back. Then came Josie, looking as excited and nervous as I felt, and Michael, who tripped over his shoelaces and stumbled, but kept on running up to us anyway. Got everything? asked Josie. I nodded and showed her the tube map I had taken from my mum's used less drawer and the tea bags I'd taken from the kitchen jar. We'd all brought things to give to the Queen. Tom had brought a packet of shortbread biscuits. Josie had a new packet of football stickers and Michael had brought a box of fudge that had a crown on the box. I brought my favourite astronaut ruler, even though the astronaut didn't move anymore. I was sure the Queen would like it, because she was always wearing sparkling brooches that shine like stars on her dresses. Maybe when she was in school, she wanted to be an astronaut too. When we had stored all the presents away safely in my bag, Josie counted all the money we had collected all of us had emptied our piggy banks and savings jars and Tom had gone into his brother's room to see what he could find. They've got loads of coins everywhere. Can't believe I've never done it before, he exclaimed, bringing out a fistful of coins. In the end, we had exactly £27.62. and pence, A fortune. Half of £27.62 and pence is... Josie squeezed her eyes tight and quickly did the maths in her head. £13.81. and pence. She gave half of the money to me and half to Tom for safekeeping. You sure you know which tube to take? asked Josie. The freckles on her face were sliding up and down as she was scrunching up her nose every few seconds. She only ever does that and she's extra nervous and it makes her look like a hamster. Yep, we take the pink line to King's Cross and then the dark blue line to Green Park. I said, Mum always takes me on the trains for a really big adventure, so I know the way. How far is the palace from the station? Asked Tom. He sounded squeaky, but I couldn't tell if this was because he was nervous or excited. I don't know, I said, but I don't think there's a bus stop in front of the palace, so we might need to take a taxi. It shouldn't be too far, though. So hopefully we won't spend all our money. Guys, our bus is here, said Michael, as he stuck out his hand so the driver would stop. Remember to tell Mrs. Can, I whispered, that me and Tom are sick and our mum said we'll be back tomorrow. Josie nodded, good luck, and giving us a quick wave, she followed Michael onto the bus to school. After the bus disappeared, Tom and I crossed the street and walked up to the bus stop where all the buses travelling in the office opposite direction stopped. When the bus we needed finally came, I put out my hand and we got on. Nervously looking at the driver, in case she asked us why we weren't in school, but she didn't. In fact, she barely even looked at us. I sat on the bus all the way to the last bus stop and then, holding hands, crossed the big road to the tube station. There were at least a million people, all dressed in suits, rushing around, trying to get through the barriers. They looked angry and red in the face, and there was lots of tutting and head shaking. 
I had never been to the train station when it was so busy before and I didn't like it. My head felt, it made my head feel hot and fuzzy. Come on, said Tom, nudging me. We walked over to the ticket machines where there was a long line of people. Some of them looked down at us with frowns on their faces, but no one said anything, so we didn't have to say anything back. When we finally got to the front of the queue, we walked up to one of the machines. It looked more scary than I remembered. There were at least a hundred buttons surrounding a large screen and a slot that looked like a letterbox at the bottom. Go on, whispered Tom. Okay, I said, not wanting to be a coward. I took a deep breath. I stood up on my toes and walked over to the walked over to the screen. I pressed the button for new ticket, then child, then typed in Buckingham Palace for the destination, but nothing happened. I tried again, but the machine started flashing. Do you kids need help? A woman asked a woman from the queue. She was dressed in a green coat and shiny shoes and had black and curly black hair and glasses. Tom's eyes became wide and he shook his head, but I nodded. The woman stepped forward. Where do you need to go? Buckingham Palace, I said, for our school trip. I tried to make my voice sound more deep and grown up sounding. The woman frowned, but then looking at her watch said, OK. She quickly pressed lots of buttons on the screen and then said, there you go, before stepping back into line. We looked up at the machine, which was flashing 8.90 at us. Tom quickly got the money out of his bag and put in the exact change. Two pieces of pink card instantly popped out like sweets from a sweet machine and grabbing them, we thanked the lady and ran down the stairs to where I knew the trains for the city would be. We squeezed ourselves onto the platform. It was so full of people that I was afraid we wouldn't be able to get on the train. I had never seen so many people squashed together in one place before. But when the train came, everyone flooded onto it like a giant wave and took us with them. Tom grabbed hold of my hand, hand and I grabbed his and we soon found ourselves pressed like sandwich filling between lots of people, all busy looking at the phones or listening to music. This is good, said Tom, his face squashed up against a large belly. I tried to nod, but someone's book was touching my head. We watched as lots of stations passed by and looked at all the different people getting on and off the train. Finally, we heard the driver announce the next station was going to be King's Cross. We have to follow the dark blue line, I said to Tom, after we jumped out onto the platform. We followed signs for Piccadilly, the Piccadilly line and got on another train. Easy. Now I wasn't feeling that. Now that I wasn't feeling so nervous, I realised I was hungry. I had been so busy packing a present for the Queen, I had forgotten about the emergency bag of sweets I meant to bring. Do you think the Queen would mind if we had one of her biscuits? I asked Tom. He shook his head eagerly. She must have lots in her kitchen, especially if she has tea every day. He ripped open the packet and passed me one of the thick, crumbly fingers that lay inside. It was the most delicious biscuit I had ever had, probably because I knew it was meant to be eaten by the Queen. We had another biscuit each on the train, and after a few minutes, the train lady announced, The next station is Green Park. Please alight here for the Jubilee and Victoria lines. I like the train lady. She has a nice, nice voice. I imagine she looks like Mary Poppins and sits at the very front of the next of the train next to the driver in her own special chair. It must be fun going through all the stations and telling people which ones are coming next. We hurried off the train and followed the signs to the taxis. Running up the stairs, we found a long line of black cabs waiting in a row. Inside the one at the front was a man with curly red hair. He was eating a sandwich and bobbing his head along to the radio station. When he saw us looking at him through the window, he rolled, the, he rolled it down and leaned out. What can I do for you two? Please, we need to get to Buckingham Palace, I said, just as loudly and clearly as I could, because I remembered 
my uncle Lenny saying that there was nothing taxi drivers, dri taxi drivers hated more than people who didn't say where they wanted to go clearly enough. The taxi man leaned forward and looked around. Why are you on your own? He asked, frowning. Uh, we're meeting our teacher there. We're on a trip and we got separated from our class and our teacher said that if anyone got lost, we had to meet the class there, said Tom on a rush. The taxi man frowned again and rubbed his chin. All right, he said eventually. Hop in and be quick about it. I ain't here to be chauffeuring lost kids around all day. You're lucky it's only a few minutes away and I've got tykes of my own. We jumped in quickly. The taxi man locked the doors and in a single move swerved off. As he drove on out onto the main road, he looked at us in a funny rectangular shaped mirror that cars always have right at the front. Uncle Lenny says they're there so that the drivers can see the traffic behind them. But I think they're there so the drivers can look at people sitting in the back seat when they think no one is looking at them. What will you be doing at Buckingham Palace today then? We're going to meet the Queen, said Tom, before I could stop him. Is that right? Asked the taxi man, looking at us again in the mirror. His eyes were smiling. Tom clapped his hands over his mouth and didn't say anything else. But the taxi man just laughed and said, Well, when you see her, say hi from me. I nodded, and the taxi man laughed again. After a few minutes, the taxi came to a stop in the traffic. The taxi man looked at his watch. Ah! They'll be doing a changing of the guards soon. You'll have to walk from here, I'm afraid. He turned around to look at us and pointed just to his right. See those arches there? Just walk under them and keep going straight down that this big road, OK? The palace is right at the end, past the water fountain. Tom nodded and took out the exact money it said on the meter. The taxi man shook his head. Don't worry, this one's on me. Just tell your teacher to be co more careful next time. Thanks, said Tom as we jumped out. You're the best taxi driver ever. The taxi man drove off laughing. I like London taxi drivers, said Tom, taking out another two of the Queen's biscuits and stuffing them into his mouth. They're better than uh, New York ones. So do I, I said, watching as the taxi disappeared out of sight.